Hey everybody, it's Matt Pinfield. The show is called In a Lonely Place. The reason it's called that is because we started it during a pandemic when I was by myself in my apartment in Hollywood. And uh, we just continue to do it, of course, because the world's been pretty crazy. But one of the things that always gets us by is the music that we love. And it's really exciting because today on the show, I'm interviewing a guy and talking to uh, somebody that I love his work. Uh, you know, if he had never done anything except just the song Aladdin saying what he did in the middle of that song, then he would have still been one of my favorite musicians ever. Uh, I just so happy to have him on the show. And I'd like to introduce you to Bowie's Piano Man, the one and only Mike Garson. Mike, how are you, man? It's nice to see you. Very you know, nice to see you and thank you for that lovely introduction. It's funny when you've recorded on maybe thousands of records and pieces of music, you get labeled with one. I sort of feel like fucking, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the guy from Vegas who did Don Uh Oh, uh, Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton is like yeah. my hit, you know, and I have to play it my whole life. Interestingly enough, I've never played the song where I play the melody because it's always been me accompanying uh the song you know for david or various singers since he's passed and uh i was just looking at it before and i thought to myself why have i never recorded this and why have i never done a solo version of it you know people talk about it and i discuss it so i'm going to start putting that together i usually was a guinea pig and test it out for you just solo piano a little later which I love, and I think it's going to be great. And by the way, we're not limiting. This show is different. We're not limiting it to seven riffs. We said it's as many as we get to and want to play because there are so many great ones. Mike, tell me about, you know, that moment. Well, well let's give a little background, too, on you and, you know, how you were such a jazz fan and, and were playing jazz. And bring us up to that moment from when you were a kid, you know, in, in Brooklyn, and take us to that moment where you met Bowie and Nick Ronson and, uh, and when that took place. Well, I was one of those guys that when I, um, I landed during Vietnam in, in the Army band, they wanted to send me over to Vietnam to shoot people, and it didn't make sense to me. So I thought, maybe I could talk them into playing an instrument. So you have to pay one more year of dues and I was in for three years, but I got into the band. And when you're in the band, you, you do a few parades every month down Fifth Avenue and you play with a big band. And I was playing the glockenspiel. <laughs> but basically, uh, you get your stripes and your awards by how many hours and how good you are you practice. So there was nothing else to do in the barracks. And I would practice eight hours a day. And I developed that discipline. And when I came out of the Army, I kept practicing. And all I wanted to do was play jazz and jazz clubs. And I don't know that that was the destiny for me. Sometimes uh, we get in our own way, you know. And I was playing, uh, I think I mentioned to, this, to you, there was a jazz club on 69th Street and Broadway and I was playing there around, let's say, September of 1972. And here I had done those thousands of hours of practicing. And I go into the jazz club and the sax player is Dave Liebman who ended up with Miles Davis. And Pete LaRocca is one of our greatest drummers of all time. And uh, in jazz, he passed a few years ago. And we're playing... And I look out into the audience and there's five people and the show is over and I made $5. And I thought something is wrong with this picture, you know? And uh, if I did 30 gigs, it would be $150, which was what my rent was in Brooklyn at the time. Yeah. So I, I came home and here's the yellow expression, uh, watch what you wish for, you know? And uh, I said to my wife, Susan, I said, I think I need to go out with a very famous rock group and make a living and use my talents that way. And the next day, David Bowie called. But I didn't know who he was. But it sounded interesting. And then uh, the rest is history. I went and auditioned for Mick Ronson and uh, 
played the song changes for maybe uh, eight seconds, and he said, "You have the gig," and and that and that's how it it begun. But um, David was a the ultimate casting director in that he knew how to frame my jazz playing and also my classical playing and put it on his music when necessary. And he chose through the 30, 40 years where we worked together, when to place it on what song, where or when, whether it was Motel on the outside album or Strange When We Meet on the outside album or very strange album called Earthling, which has had a lot of drum and bass. There's a song called Battle for Britain. He asked me to play one of those crazy solos on that, certainly on Aladdin Sane. And then he asked for more normal stuff on Lady Grinning Soul, but very romantic and time. He wanted sort of a very strange, old-fashioned piano from the 1920s, like barroom, mixed with some of my avant-garde playing. So it's been a very uh, interesting trip. I didn't understand what brought me there. I didn't. I just didn't know that world. And if I'm to be totally honest, I still don't know that world. There's so much I could learn from you. You're like an encyclopedia. And I, I just know Bill Evans and Miles Davis and Coltrane. And I learned about Lizzie in the last few weeks, for example, you know, and she's great. And so many talented people that I seem to resonate more with because somehow there's a uh, more heart and feeling that comes from the artists in the, in the world that you're connected to and, that now I am. The jazz world, I love it, but it's a little headier and a little more elitist, almost uh, snobby a little bit, you know. it's I still love it, but it's it's I, I, I sometimes enjoy playing my style over great rock drummers and bass players and guitarists than in a traditional setting. But I really shouldn't compare because in any space that I'm in, I kind of make it my own. And I just love playing the piano. The piano is the center point of my life. And improvisation is goes along with that, and it doesn't have to be jazz or rock or classical. Event. It's whatever is required in the moment. And it's amazing. So they asked you to join the band. So you ended up playing literally with the first U.S. show for Ziggy, didn't you? When, when, where was that? Was that in Cleveland or? Good memory. I had the first show was in Cleveland. I had a few days, maybe a week, to learn the music. And it was shocking because, as I told you, I'm in a jazz club with kind of a piano that's not very good and no audience and people being very judgmental who was there. I still was playing great. And then all of a sudden I show up in Cleveland for the sound check. And I look to the right of the piano. I'm sitting there at the piano, and I see a PA system that was going up at least 10 feet with about eight or 10 speakers. And uh, I said to David or somebody or Mick uh, Ronson, I said, the PA is facing in the wrong direction. I said, I don't need that much help. And they said, no, that's your monitor system. There's the PA, and they pointed something that went up like 50 feet in the air. It was like <laughs> humongous, like $300,000. And I'm thinking, I barely get a piano on a gig, and I bring a little tuning hammer, you know, and a, and a jazz fake book. And I said, oh, I'm in a new world now. And it was a very funny moment because my life totally changed after that. And I go on the stage in Cleveland, and all of a sudden, David Bowie has never played in America and the audience went absolutely wild. And when we finished the encore, because I had my music on the piano, I started putting it all neatly together and everything. And I see the band storm off stage down some back entrance to get into an elevator to get out of there. And I see 5,000 people rushing the stage. And I'm, <laughs> I'm there alone on the stage with my music walking off and I said, I better move, you know, <laughs> I started yeah. running off because I would have absolutely been attacked because now I was part of the spiders in a way. I was sort of the odd man, the additional guy, kind of like Nicky Hopkins was in a way with the Rolling Stones and, and with Stewart, uh, yeah, Stewart, Stewie as well. Yeah. That's amazing. You know, um, 
as a Bowie fan, as a kid growing up too, you know, the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, 72 bootleg that was, you know, as a young kid, I was really, I love Bowie so much and was really hungry to find other things. So you would buy bootlegs on vinyl and the Santa Monica Civic Center concert uh, that you played at as well is, is considered one of the best bootlegs. And later when it was released, I remember seeing that the, I think the band, the pay was unbelievable. It was like, Bowie might've made $60. The other guys like Mick, Trevor and Woody might've made 35 for that night or something. Do you remember uh, what that was like? Because obviously Tony DeFreeze was, you know, was notorious for not, you know, giving David what he, what he was really deserved and what he earned. But what was it like uh, on that show and those kind of things? What was it like being paid at that period of time? I, I didn't get paid even for that. Yeah. To this day. No, I never was paid for that. And I was, you know, getting a salary at the time, but it was, it was, I thought it was fair enough, but I thought the Mick and the guys were making 10 times more than me. And I felt they deserved it because they'd been with David a few years as the Spiders for Mars. Turned out I was making almost 10 times more than them. So it's, it's, it was kind of sad. Uh, I think the guys were getting about $80 a week and, uh, I think I was making eight hundred dollars. It was in nineteen seventy-two, which seemed fine to me. But when I was talking with the guys on the airplane one day, they were embarrassed, and they said, "How how, how much are you making?" And I said, "You know, I'm embarrassed. It's not a lot, but I don't deserve a lot because I'm the new man on the block." And their faces kind of dropped when I they realized I was making ten times more than them. So I took a bullet, and the next tour I went down to 500, and they went up to 500. So I was real happy. But, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't David as much as, you know, the music business. What can I tell you? The music business, as much as I love music, is as much as I hate the music business. But that's nothing new. It's just you get a lot of people that are dishonest, and they're parasitic, and they have other agendas. There are some great people in the business who really mean well, but... And certainly in the era I grew up, you know, the first gig I played, Matt, I was 14 in the Catskill Mountains, which is 110 miles north of New York City. And we were supposed to get $40. It was my first band. It was called the Impromptu Quartet. <laughs> and I, I guess I had the word improvisation, impromptu from a very young age. And we, we played the gig and... Uh, went over to the our so-called manager and i said you know i think we've earned forty dollars tonight yeah <laughs> you know, a whole lot that's divided among four people you know and he takes out a gun so that was my introduction to the music business yeah and david yeah. bowie shared stories with me i won't say the names of some of the rock bands he said but some of the guys would go around to the other bands in london and break the keyboard player's fingers because they didn't want competition. David told me that. Unbelievable, yeah. There were definitely a lot of mobsters in those days, you know. Yeah. The Hardens and the, uh, even, you know, Peter Gregg came from uh, that school. And here in America, Morris Levy and folks like that, there were some, just some pretty amazing people. But let's get back to the positive side of things. Let's talk about the making of Aladdin Sane because that record – obviously is so important and it it went to another level for david obviously ziggy hunky dory the other albums before it man so we're all great albums i love those albums yeah. but you coming up with that incredible centerpiece of the song aladdin saying i just you know it's just one of the most memorable pieces of music i mean everything you did on that record let's talk about that and that experience Okay. You know, I guess I don't, it's a funny situation because I was only hired for eight weeks on the first American Z tour. So this album was going to be happening maybe five or six months later than I wasn't even supposed to be there. So I think because I delivered the goods on the Ziggy tour, David thought maybe the piano could bring something new because he wasn't a guy that could sit comfortable in any comfort zone. So uh, he brought me into Trident Studio, which, as you probably know, 
was a magical studio in London and had a piano that the Beatles used, Queen used. Listen, I could acknowledge that I did a nice job and take credit and be very grateful and thankful, but this piano spit the notes out to me. I'm telling you, it, it found me these notes. You couldn't play a wrong note on this Beckstein piano. It, it lasted there for many years. It's gone now, but uh, so I'm in that studio. What what amuses me very much is in those days when you're in the studio, you would listen not through small speakers, but these gigantic speakers on the wall. It, it ruined too many uh, engineers and mixers ears and yeah. so people don't listen that way but we used to love listening to through them. every night matt we broke the speakers we blew them out every night they every day they'd come back in with a whole well they had two humongous speakers they yeah they, they would they would bring in new ones i mean of course god knows thousands of dollars because we were blown out listening that loud. So I was introduced to a different world. And uh, David and Mick Ronson would just give me these songs. They'd say, here's Watch That Man. Here's uh, Let's Spend the Night Together, the uh, Rolling Stones song, you know, a Mick song. And then Mick Jagger. And then, and then there'd be like Lady Grinning Soul, very romantic time. As I said, and then finally, they said this song, Aladdin Sane, which is the one, you know, you keep referring to it. I played a blues solo first. I actually played a blues solo. And David said, no, that's too commonplace. So I played a Latin solo. And David said, no, nah, we've heard that before. He said, you told me when we used to drive around in the limousines through America that you played on the avant-garde jazz scene in, in New York. Can you play something like that? And my remark was, that's why I'm not working Saturday night. And he laughed. He said, leave that to me. So between you, me, and the lamppost, it was really just one take. And that was it. And I hadn't heard for maybe 10, 15 years. I just, it, to me, it was just another studio take, and I played some bizarre solo. So, you know, I should probably be dead and not know historically that this lasted through time because that's about 47 years ago, 48 years ago. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, 1973. And, you know, so we look to it, you know, you're speaking of some of the really off-center and cool things you did. Even the intro to Let's Spend the Night Together on Aladdin Sane because it's, it's just complete chaos. Tell me how you guys decided to do that as an intro on that record. I think I was blessed with a surge of energy when I went to the studio, because, you know, they said, do you know that song, Let's Spend the Night? I said, well, I think I've heard it, you know, and all of a sudden, I said, how about this? And it's so great, because then you catch right up, you know, with, with the song. The right, right. So good. And, you know, it's great. It, um, it had a freshness about it. It's not so much that they were weird notes. Uh, they could have been this. Because uh, anything that I play, I play from my heart. It's that song didn't require that. But I try to play musically and fit the situation. Because I've always loved playing for singers. Prior to meeting David, I think I had played for close to 900 singers. Because I used to be on these gigs, and every night there'd be another singer, night after night. Two, sometimes two, not two singers, from the worst that you've ever heard <laughs> to uh, Mel Tomé. Yeah, that's amazing. To Martha Reeves and the Vandellas to, it just goes on, to Nancy Wilson, the jazz singer who passed away last year. Yeah. So I was blessed. Of course, David, <laughs> you know, he was the top of the ladder because he was David Bowie, you know. Now, can you play a little bit of a line and sing that part for us right now? Would you mind doing that? I think I would. Uh, would you rather? Do you, you want to save that one for the end? Or do you want yeah, it for now? Save it for the end. I, did, I actually did my homework for you. Only oh. for you would I have done this. Nobody's asked for the seven best licks that I played on David Bowie, and I found them. Yeah. So, them. which is amazing. Uh, you know, well, I, I'm ready to play them in order of lack of importance up to the most important 
which is great. And, you know, so, but I mean, everything on that record, time again, your piano parts in, you're in the middle of time also. It's such, it brings so much character to the song itself, you know, it, uh, and then under that final verse, just so it's, it's incredible. I, I, think you, I think, you know, from interviewing so many hundreds of great artists, we don't know when our best work comes and we shouldn't, but I don't fully understand the word zeitgeist, but there's something about certain periods of time, certain things happen. Rap had to happen at a certain point in time. The Beatles happened at a certain point in time. Uh, Chopin had to happen at a certain time. Mozart, Bach, David Bowie. So it's it was one of those moments because I've done Aladdin saying, believe it or not, on the uh, David Live album, yeah, great solo, and in 40 years, nobody has ever mentioned it. But about 100,000 people have mentioned the Aladdin Saint solo from the Aladdin Saint album. So it's not about me. It's about whatever that magic is, and you don't know when it's going to come. And when you try to prepare for it, uh, it's even worse. So I always use – I wrote a jazz tune back in the uh, 90s called Get Out of Your Own Way, and it's still true. It's still true. <laughs> That's great. So the next album you worked on was, of course, the covers album. David's love for all those bands that even when he was trying to make it with like the lower third and the Manish Boys and all the different people and things that he was doing at that time, he still loved all the contemporary music that was happening in the 60s with that British Invasion stuff. So the pinups album, tell me about those sessions. Before I tell you that, I owe you this. Yeah. Oh, I love it. It's so great. Time is just, you know. Isn't that a great song? And then the way it just goes. And then you go back, and I'm playing the style. I love that. So, <laughs> it's so great. In those days, in the 20s and 30s, there was music that sounded like. <laughs> that kind of a thing. <laughs> and uh, so David said, can you do something? They call it stride piano because you have the chord, the octave down here and the chord. It's Kind of tricky to play it, you know. You hit the octave and then the chord, and he said, "Can you do that?" But make it a little weird when you do. Uh... He didn't want just like he wanted weird, you know. So I made that mixture, and it was. It's 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 like the guy was a mind reader, and everything that I had practiced from the stories I told you before of the eight hours a day, every lick that I ever practiced every style, he got into my head and found that and put it on a track, whether it was Motel or Time, The Lady Grinning Soul or Aloud Insane, Strangers When We Meet, Small Plot of Land, um, Deranged, on and all, Battle for Britain, you know, from the Earthling. So it, 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 you have to give credit where credit's due and not that he needed the credit when he was alive or now, but I'm, I'm forever, um, grateful for his perception to know who I was more than I knew at the time. I think I had the gift, but I didn't have, I was a little naive. Yeah. He, he knew how to use my piano playing to, to serve his thing and boost his career. The record companies knew it was different than the Rolling Stones or this and that, because all of a sudden, where did that come from? But that was David, you know? It was amazing. And on pinups, when you did things like on CMLE Play, the Pink Floyd cover, there were a bunch of cool fills that you did in that song as well. What was that session like? Was it, did David say, you know what? I want to give myself a break now and, you know, do, instead of having to write a whole new album at this time, I'm going to do a covers album. I, you know, I just been touring for these last two albums for Ziggy and Aladdin Sin. 
was that kind of the, the mood that he wanted to just have fun making a record of some of his favorite songs? What was that? Like? You know, he was an encyclopedia, kind of like you, in how he knew uh, rock and roll, American and English. And he just wanted to do English covers. And uh, see Emily play, you know, first of all, it's a great song. And they still were thinking about my playing on Aladdin, saying they wanted me to be a little wild towards the end of that solo. I never heard that one till the till Sid Barrett died. I, I hadn't heard it since the recording date in 1973. And I didn't remember playing that. And good old Mick Ronson, he orchestrated the strings for that. It sounds phenomenal in relationship to the piano and all the stuff. So it was magical. But songs like Sorrow and all that, he just loved those songs. And um, we were in uh, outside of Paris. I think the same studio that Elton John did records in, and many people, I think they called it the Chateau or something like that. What was great about it, we were in this beautiful Chateau, and we slept there, we ate there, and we were a band. And, and the drummer, by the way, was Ainsley Dunbar on that, who, of course, you would know from Journey and other bands. Just yeah. And Zapper, great, great drummer. And Lulu came in and she sang Man Who Sold the World. And I played electric piano on that one, which I played a very subdued part, but it went to number one for her. David never had a number one with his own song, Man Who Sold the World. I know people don't realize that wasn't really released as a single. You know what I mean? It was for him, it was an album track. So it's cool how many people have done it. Of course, the famous Nirvana version too. Diamond Dogs in 74, there's a lot of stuff going that was happening around this time that led to David Live as well. But talk to me about the recording of Diamond Dogs. It's such a dark album, and I know that I love that record. It's one of my favorite albums uh, ever, actually. But there's so many interesting things going on on that record, Mike. Like, you know, in We Are the Dead, which is just such a great song, and the way that you use space when you're playing. And even all the other things like going, you know, doing Sweet Thing or the interlude going into the chant of the ever circling skeletal family. All these. Oh. Things. And then when you go, and then you all of a sudden you go, din, din, din. I love just the way the transitions. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's very, it's got that very Velvet Underground ending to it, which is brilliant. Uh, but uh, right before the pandemic, I was on tour with the alumni, some of the alumni from David's uh, era traveling, and we were doing the Diamond Dogs album in complete. So it, it's new. It was in, in a way new and refreshing to me because I hadn't heard that album. Uh, the, the, I recorded it in, I think, 74, or maybe three, 74, and then I think I heard it in 98. Wow, which is amazing. And, and I was amazed at how great an album it is. And Sweet Thing, uh, you know, Time was one of the seven licks. Sweet Thing, there's this little part where I go... things like that yeah even on 1984 you know i'm kind of loose in the studio and i remember watching uh what, what, was it star trek in the 60s that was on television yeah yeah star trek yeah and th th they did this oh, yeah. you, got, yeah. you got the piano you yeah. have a camera on that steve yeah almost like an outer limits thing too and I, I was just sitting there, and David records it, and it opens up. In 1984, I actually played that one on harpsichord. They brought a harpsichord in for me. So that was your harpsichord, and it's great. The, the way that it's recorded, the sound, the echo on that harpsichord just sounds so cool. Tell me, can you talk to me and kind of lay that... Well, I have to tell you, you know too much about music. I can't do this anymore. <laughs> no, it's amazing. Okay. You know, it's, it's a moron. How do you know all this shit? 
Well, you know, I just loved it growing up. And, you know, I sat with David. We were on couches across from each other. Coco was over in the corner, like taking notes on me and David. We're having a brainstorming session. And David said to me, he goes, you know, I, and it blew me away that he said, Matt, I so appreciate how much you know about my music and, and love music. And I said, well, David, I have to thank you because when I discovered your music, I realized there was a whole other world out there. So it sent me on a different trajectory. And I got the to- guitar your first instrument? Um, well, yeah, I mean, guitar, piano, I love everything. I mean, there's no question about it. But I, I wanted to ask you um, more about Diamond Dose because it's just, there's a lot of mystery about that re making of that record, um, except for stories where I heard, you know, David recorded Rebel Rebel and like five in the morning and someone brought him that clear guitar, like that, you know, guitar that was completely clear into the studio. But what can you tell me about those sessions? They were in New York City, right? Was that where, where they took place? The sessions that I did, believe it or not, Oh, we're in Olympic Studio in London. Oh, so the album started in the UK and then everything I did was in London, just about. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Sweet thing candidate when you rock and roll with me. Yeah, because yeah, they're all might have been a few I did in the States, but I just remember uh Olympic Studio because Rolling Stones recorded there, right? And yeah. there many groups. And when I walked in, I saw this Hammond B three organ. That was Keith Emerson's organ. But when Keith would play it, he had straps all over the organ that he put on his body, and the organ would turn upside down when he performed. So I'm walking in the studio, and I see <laughs> I see this organ and the straps, and I think, Jesus, I really am not in a jazz club anymore. I'm just, you know, so I started to get the idea of wanting to do concerts with a piano floating over the audience. I've never brought it into reality. <laughs> I'd probably do it with CGI now. But I always wanted to hover with the, a big nine foot piano over the audience in Madison Square Garden. But anyway, yeah, it was Olympic Studio, magical studio. And uh, I was living in Sussex, England, which is sort of the country at the time. We moved from New York to be with him when he was recording, and I would take the train to that studio. And unlike a lot of other albums, this was pretty much David alone. Tony Visconti was there, and 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 me essentially. Uh, there was Herbie Flowers on bass when when he was there, and there was uh, Tony Newman on drum. But there was a lot of time. It was just me and him in the studio. And he would talk to me about how he would cut up the lyrics and he would yeah. to William Burroughs and you know all that. Yeah, the cut up method. Yeah, he would cut up all those, uh, you know, you learned that William Burroughs thing, which was so cool. I think that's how I play the piano. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I but I, I, a cut up. I mean, We Are the Dead is a perfect example, right, of the cut up method William Burroughs created and putting those phrases together, yet they're so cool and so... Ah. Very simple. I don't usually play that simple. Yeah, it's a great track. I, lo I love that. So at this point, you're getting ready, Mike. You're going to go out on tour again. Uh, you're part of the touring band. Now, it's legendary that when the tour started, the earlier part, it was just this amazing spectacle with like David coming down in the hand, you know, beating the telephone, you know, doing space on it and all. So, and then halfway through the tour, right, did he decide to go and just strip down because it was so expensive to do the tour? He switched gears, and that's basically what we heard on David Live, you know, from the tower in Philly. He went, so tell me about that. You were, because you were there for the entire experience. Do you remember the day that he said, you know, hey, this is really costing me too much. We're losing money on this tour. Uh, what was that like? The Diamond Dogs tour. Uh, the set took a few days to set up, so we needed two sets. It was like a Broadway show. So uh, when the money ran out, and we were in now, we went from the East Coast towards the West Coast. When the money ran out, uh, we had a wonderful musical director on the Diamond Dogs tour. I was playing piano, and this gentleman was playing keyboards. His name is Michael Kamen who's a wonderful uh, composer and keyboard player and arranger, orchestrator. He did a lot of conducting for a lot of the rock bands, as you know, through the years. Yeah, Metallica, you know, he did that whole thing with those guys. Thing, yeah. um, so he actually uh, let go of uh, 
Herbie Flowers and and Tony Newman and Michael Kamen. And he said, Mike, I want you to put a band together called the Garson Band. Open the show for us. We'll be at the, the Spectrum and many other places. Uh, in fact, one of those albums was released this week on vinyl. It's a soul album. Yeah. And, uh, from one of the shows we did in Michigan. And then I think they took some live stuff from one of the other dates. But uh, I got to hear it. It was great. And he said, uh, have Luther sing Luther Vandross. Let, have him open the show, singing with you. And his friend, Jeff McCormack, who was known as War and Peace, have him sing some stuff. Have Dave Sanborn play uh, alto jazz solo on some song. You play uh, some piano and organ and mini moog and just have a ball. And uh, go out there for 40 minutes. And then I'll come out. And you, you'll close with uh, the Sun Machine song. What was that called? Uh, Memory of a Free, free Festival? Memory of a Free Festival. Yes. He said, uh, close with that and, and we'll dovetail and I'll come out. I, I don't know I told you the story, but when I was at the Spectrum, the audience was there for David naturally, right? And he was a phenomenon already. Uh, it has been now a year and a half since we've been there before. And we have a white carpet on the stage. And I'm on a beautiful nine-foot Steinway piano. And Luther is a, a foot in front of me near the piano. And all of a sudden, we started to sing a tune. I think we were doing um, some soul tune. Um, I can't remember it. it, it it'll come to me. And, and uh, we're doing that a total different kind of music. And I see an egg flying in the air towards us. It was a raw egg. It landed on the white carpet, total yellow spot, but they wanted us out of there. And I couldn't blame them if they're there to see David Bowie, you know, doing uh, Ziggy. <laughs> and we we're playing like, we were like the OJs or something. Yeah. <laughs> Luther, you know, he has that whole black history and the roots of that. Uh, and we were doing uh, Soul Train or one of those songs. It was nothing to do with anything. And then we would do an old jazz standard called Moody's Mood for Love uh, that was sung by a famous jazz singer. Uh, uh. I mean, just totally <laughs> in left field on the David Bowie concert, but only David would trust me to do that. And I'd have to go out every night and tune the mini mode because it would go out of tune. Uh, and every night before the show, I'd have to go out and grab the knobs. It wasn't like today, everything digital. And uh, it was an amazing tour. And so was the Diamond Dogs tour. My biggest regret, and so was David's, is we don't have the great footage from the Diamond Dogs tour that we have in all these other tours. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was when you think about it, it's pretty amazing. And the fact that somebody threw an egg, you know, I think about some of the audiences, what assholes those people were that would go to shows in the 70s. I mean, who brings an egg to a concert, right? And then you take, so you know, you hear those famous stories about Joe Perry, you know, like Aerosmith, somebody threw an M80 and uh, the fire, you know, the, fire, the M80 firecracker and almost blew part of his hand off. It's just crazy people. But, but regardless, those were great. And, you know, let's face it, you brought Luther Vandross in, into the band and David Sanborn, and through that, their careers sailed afterwards. I mean, that's, one of the things that David was good at doing as well, but you were responsible with David for, for that happening. And, you know, years later, I remember asking uh, Luther, I ran into him in the lobby of the hit factory. I was there uh, doing one of my A&R things for Columbia. And um, I, uh, I'd asked him, I said, Hey, you know, Luther, you did a version of fascination from young Americans, but you called yours funky music as a part of me. I said, why are they different? You go road. He goes, uh, well, David didn't want to be presumptuous and say, Funky music is a part of me. So he thought that was too presumptuous, so he changed it to fascination. That's totally true. I have to give a lot of credit uh, for Luther being there to Carlos Alomar. Uh, he had a lot to do with that. And he was one of the greatest rhythm guitar players that ever lived. And also to Michael Kamen, who, who knew a David Sanborn. They became my friends and part of my band, but they were the brains behind that, and I just furthered it, you know? You know, I tell you, I, I got stuck in an airport 
uh, lounge with uh, with David Sanborn. And it was the greatest thing because we just went in this back room and I just told me Bowie stories and talked about a bunch of stuff. So it was very, very cool. Uh, but anyway, so that that now, now that segues into after David Live, Young Americans, of course, Sigma Sound and you guys in Philadelphia. Tell me about that. Let's start talking about that because that's an incredible. Well, I remember when they all gathered around putting the vocal parts on on Young Americans. They're phenomenal vocals. And there was at least six background singers, and they was right in the middle, and they were each choosing the notes. But Luther was the brains behind assigning each part. But I knew I have to contribute something, and I knew this was not going to be Aladdin Sane or Sweet Thing Candidate or Time. It, it wasn't a Mike Garson feature, but I had a different role, very supportive on songs like Can You Hear Me and it's, you know, Gotta Be Right. And um, But on Young Americans, I remember doing a glissando, which is when you go down the keyboard. I'll do it again. different way of playing after everybody's used to me doing all this kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, all that kind of playing, which was we call a tonal. Here I am playing the simplest kind of piano playing, both gospel and some of the ballads and that. And see what happened between 72 and 74, not too many people know this, is David had five different bands between 72 and 74. And they everyone got fired except me. I was the only one that lasted in all of them. Not because we were friends, which we were, but because I could change styles with him because my whole life was music and piano and anything that I heard, whether it was Paul Anker doing Diana or You Are My Destiny, or it was uh, Cecil Taylor playing a avant-garde piano or some kind of gospel. <laughs> a few notes you know you, you, you choose your, your moments one of the things about playing with a singer is it's a collaboration and it's not like you're the accompanist i never saw it that way it's a duet and yeah. you're making magic together you're communicating you're connected telepathically and it's it's uh it's a terrible thing uh, when you're so connected, I'm saying this from a different viewpoint, when you, you're that connected to the singer, because when we were in Germany in 2004, David was having heart pains, which led to his heart attack. And when I was accompanying him on the song, my fingers and my body felt weird and something I knew wasn't right because of that spiritual, musical, telepathic connection. And of course he was taken to the hospital, thank God. He survived that, And but he was a little gun shy to go out and do touring after that. And about a year later, around 2005 or six, he asked if I do a few duet concerts with him because he was nervous to play with a band. He wanted to build his confidence. And we did a few things together, which were lovely. And uh, I miss him still, you know? Yeah, that's amazing stuff and I'm, uh... I'm so glad we, he lived as long as he did because we, uh, I mean, you know, we love him so much. Let's talk more about the Young American Sessions too because obviously he was a fan of Bruce Springsteen's because you guys did Growing Up and It's Hard to Be a Saint in the City from Greetings from Asbury Park. Um, in those sessions, which weren't, of course, released till years later, as well as songs like Who Can I Be Now and some of the other stuff that were outtakes, which were, you know, both fan like me found them on bootlegs or whatever. But I tell me about... Bruce Springsteen coming down to the studio because there's a there's a story behind that. He came down to, to see David there. You know, um, I've read about the various stories and the things that have gone on and were shared and, and whatever stuff went down. But I wasn't privy to that, only like a fan later on hearing stories. So I just knew that there's this great guy named Bruce there and I go out and have dinner with him and 
I'm playing some of his songs. And I, like I said, because I was a jazz musician, I didn't know much about his music. I just could feel the talent and the beauty of the person. And, uh, but he sat there in the studio and it was just like fun to play those songs of his. It, for me, I never care who wrote it as long as I could bring something to the table that will make some magic to maybe make the track better. I put myself in a very embarrassing situation with David one day where um, we're sitting around at SIR Studios in New York. Uh, <laughs> and I said, you know, we're going to, that song, My Death, that we did the other day, that's the best song you ever wrote. <laughs> It was written by Jacques Brel. Jacques Brel, right. And he, heard <laughs> he looked at me like, this guy really is an idiot. But I love his playing, so I'll just tolerate him. That's <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Well, you know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people didn't realize that those were Jacques Brel's songs, even in those early Ziggy eras, uh, days, because he did Amsterdam, too. That's right. And, you know, both of them he discovered because of Scott Walker. I mean, you That's know, right. Scott Walker. Right. So, you know, so because David had the ability – to make the song his own? It could have been his song. Yeah. So I wasn't that far off base, but um, I got to tell you a Scott Walker story. I love that you're keeping me on track because you know the sequence that you're taking me through, but it's the side stories that I get a kick out of because the other stuff, obviously, I've discussed in books and what have you. Yeah, so, so tell me some of those. That's we're on the, Yeah, we're on the bus in 2002. We just come from the sound check. And he said, Mike, come with me on the bus. Nobody's on the bus. And he says, I got to play you this album of Scott Walker. And he proceeds to play it for me. Scott Walker had a great voice and very creative and great artist. And he starts telling me how he doesn't sing anything near this guy. And this guy is his hero. And he's like essentially telling me he's a piece of shit. <laughs> and I'm thinking... It's time for me to give this friend of mine a lecture because I was his senior by a year and a half. So I'm the old guy. So I, I said, David, he is great, but you have a magic and a charisma when you get in front of an audience and maybe his voice is a little better from the way you're talking about, just like there might be a concert pianist or a jazz pianist who has maybe more chops than me or more fingers. But it's not about that. You know that more than anyone. But he was so enamored with him. And, and we had many conversations over the years about Scott. And I just had to say to him, maybe he needed a friend to say, you are even a greater artist. And I don't like to compare because Scott is a great artist. But the truth is the truth is the truth. And, and, yeah. Well, David was multi, multi had mo so many, he was so multifaceted. David was an incredible performer, everything that, you know, and he was always pushing the boundaries and, and pushing himself. Where Scott, of course, became a recluse and, you know, didn't perform after the Walker Brothers and maybe a little bit. Uh, but, and speaking of my death, it's a funny story that he did that as, on a BBC show. Like he had a show called The Scott Show because he was a big star. Uh, the Walker Brothers were huge in the, in the UK, even though he was from California. Um, and none of them were brothers. Uh, but, his real name is Scott Engel. But it's funny because he did My Death on this BBC show, Scott Walker, and it was canceled right after. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> which is so funny. I love that story. Yeah, he's like, there's a new hit. I'm going to hit Cold Breath. I prefer your version and David's version to uh, any of the versions. Of course, it's a Jacques Brel song, but it's the version that you guys started doing on the Ziggy tour that's on those live, you know, it's also on the Ziggy Stardust, the motion picture uh, version from 73 from the Hammersmith Odeon. But I first heard it on that Santa Monica one. That's how I knew the song first as a young, as a young teenager. And, Best version, the best version, version the best. The, the one best, you did. <laughs> the best version that I recall was at the Manhattan Center, just me and him 
playing a charity event in the late 90s. Wow, is that is that exist on video somewhere? You can see it on YouTube, or I'll send you the link. It is absolutely will rip your heart out. Yeah, because I love that song. And it has a, it's about a hundred times better than even the ones you were talking about, which I, I played it for him, with him many different ways, many styles. I listened at times where I didn't play; it was just Nick Ronson and him. But this version we did at the Manhattan Center. I'll make sure. I get that to you, or you could look it up on YouTube. Just put David Bowie and, and Mike Carson at my death. Yeah, I love that. So, when uh, when John Lennon first came down for the Young American sessions, uh, you know, Tony Visconti told me one time that David was kind of like a little bit nervous with John coming in the first time, and was was doing illustrations in the studio, and John was trying to engage with him, and that uh, David was a little bit nervous about John because obviously he was a huge Beatles fan, a big fan of John's. Were you there for that? that? I wasn't there for that because there's no piano on that song. Yeah. I put, put piano when we did it live, for sure, over the years. Uh, I just know that in all the years, um, all the years that um, I worked with him, there were not too many people who he praised beyond belief. Scott Walker was one. In jazz, he liked Stan Kenton, by the way. Yeah. And, and John Lennon was the other one. One day when we were in the bus, he just, I could just feel the love and that he considered him a senior and they were close friends. So I, it, 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 it made me feel close to John, you know? Yeah, that's amazing. And you mentioned Carlos Alomar, too. Carlos was great. I got to um, get to know him pretty well. We were both on the Board of Governors of the Grammys uh, in New York City. So one of my favorite things to do was to just sit and have a conversation with Carlos about all the – he played on Motown records he never got credit for, James Brown records he never got credit for. Guy's amazing, you know. And, of course, he was te teaching at Stevens Tech in Hoboken, New Jersey. Just – but what an amazing guy. What an amazing player. So – when you put that band together, Mike, and you guys, was that one of your favorite bands that you toured with at that period? Yeah, I love that band. You know, to listen to him play a groove, it's it's a music lesson. But yeah. you know what? I was sitting one day at the piano and he jumped on the drums and it sounded an amazing groove. And then another time he jumped over to the piano when he was playing like... <laughs> just was grooving that it wasn't like hard part but he was just grooving he couldn't help it and when he would touch the uh strings i'll tell you a very funny story there was a musical director in the mid 90s who was a very good musician named peter schwartz and he was very good he was with us on the outside tour and he put a great band together with me and carlos and it was reeves gabrels you know and uh, who was playing drums? Uh, I think it was Zach Alford playing drums. And Zach had played with uh, Bruce Springsteen for a while also after uh, Max left. And uh, we were just rehearsing. Uh, I don't know if it was Let's Dance or Fame. And Pete, Peter was a very good musician. He knew guitar as well as keyboard. But he actually goes over to Carlos to show him where to put his hand position for he's a keyboard player telling Carlos Alomar how to play for a tune that he wrote. That he co wrote. That he co wrote. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if it was that song or another, but it was like they got into a fight. And wow. David heard this fight. And it was over for that guy and then then David shrunk the band down to Gail, me and Reeves and he was too older in his life it wasn't that old, he was 40, 50 or whatever, but he just didn't want any of that kind of bad energy anymore, so the band which had a whole, uh, we had two or three background singers and uh, a, a, two guitars and, and another keyboard, like I said, the other guy, Peter, was playing. He stripped it down to Galen, Dorsey, myself, and uh, Reeves, and Zach. And it, it, that was another amazing band. The band, the Young American Bands, with Dennis Davis on drums, was 
beyond belief. That's the one you were talking about. Again, Carlos was there. So I, I've played with, I think, 13 or 14 bands with David over the span from 72 to his last tour, which would have been over in around 2004. And uh, there was never a bad band. Yeah, no. You know, I, at different days of the week, different months, different years. Oh, that's my favorite band with Zach and Gail and Reeves because we just could improvise something. Oh, no, the reality band with Jerry Leonard and, and Earl Slick. Oh, oh, but what about the Spiders? Oh, that was an amazing band. But what about when you did these duets? Oh, you know, so <laughs> there was never a bad band because David had a gift that whoever he hired was perfect for the gig. What a gift, right? Yeah, absolutely. He seriously did. And, you know, so, you know, some of your fans out there might want me to also talk to you about some other artists as well. I mean, which is because you play with some great people. Let's talk about the stuff that you did with Smashing Pumpkins, because uh, I had some people reach out to me on my socials and go, are oh, you going to talk to them about a door and a machina? And so I wanted to talk to you about that, how that uh, transpired and how you ended up getting involved with Billy Corgan and, and company there. You know, I was touring with a jazz band in the middle of the country, and I never heard of the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, one of some young lady who was an opera singer, no, my godson, my godson, uh, from, who was about 12 or 13, said, David Bowie, ah, that's not what you want to be listening to. You want to listen to Smashing Pumpkins because he grew up with them. I said, who are they? And so I listened to them. and Well, I didn't listen to them. I, I, I remembered it. And then I appeared in Paris on a show, on a television show with David, and there were all these bands. And all of a sudden, I hear the Smashing Pumpkins uh, name come out. So I go out and watch them do that Butterfly song, whatever. Yeah, Butterfly Broken Ray. Right. Yeah. And I thought, my godson was right. These guys are good. So I made a little thing in my mind. I'd like to sometime work with him, you know. And then in the middle, before we went on to perform on the show, David invites me. He, he sends his bodyguard to get me to have a discussion with him and Billy Corgan about God. Wow. This so in the middle of the day. He says, yeah, Mike needs to be in on this conversation. Go get Mike. And there's Billy, me, and him. I never met the guy before. And, and we're talking about God. That's amazing. Bullwood Butterfly Wings, it's around that period of time. You see that you're there. So that's around melancholy or so. So that was when you first met him. And then I said, I'd love to play with you sometime. And and then several years later, the Adore Tour was coming about. And I'm on this jazz gig in Wisconsin or Wyoming. I can't remember where I was. And I knew uh, someone who was the head of the record label at the time that Billy was connected with. And I heard he was looking for a piano player and he was auditioning and people were not passing the test because Billy Corgan was a pretty uh, strong taskmaster and he knows what he wants. So I called, I think it was Nancy from uh, EMI. Uh, I Nancy Berry, right. Nancy Berry. And I said, I knew her because I think I had done some stuff with uh, Nine Inch Nails on a recording. So, so, so uh, I said, can you call... Billy, tell him I'd maybe be interested in doing his tour. And 10 minutes later, he reached out and he said, I had no idea you'd want to play with me. I said, you know, it'd be my pleasure, you know. And uh, I'll never forget going to the sound check and the Bowie musicians were loud. This was five times louder than any Bowie band I ever played with. And the keyboards supposedly were blasting but when him and james were playing guitar and jimmy and uh whoever was playing yeah this was on a pumpkin show and it was jimmy playing drums and darcy it was so loud i never heard a note in this sound check of my keyboards but all of a sudden the fuse blew in the house on the guitars so i was left playing alone and I almost went deaf from what I was playing, which I couldn't hear a note of when they were playing. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So that was an experience. But the thing about the Adore Tour is good old William Corgan, as he likes me to call him, 
he's sitting with about 80 hours of that tapes of all those shows that he has never released. And they are amazing. Those, we had three drummers. We had Kenny uh, Aronoff playing drums. I mean, he was beyond amazing. And the music was incredible and Billy was incredible. And I remember one day being in Portugal, we, we played on one of his songs so it's, for 40 minutes. He just jammed after he was done with the song. So, you know, he loved making music and I loved working with, with Billy. That's great. And then Gina, I, I contributed a song or two, but there's not enough piano playing on it. it. I wished I had done more with him, but certainly live I did. They, you know, Billy was a little like David Bowie. In the middle of a show, he asked me to start playing Summertime by George Gershwin for an audience that never heard of Gershwin or Summertime. And I'm starting to play Summertime and I'm kind of playing. Thank you for that. That's cool. That's great. So he was for that. Think of that for 20,000 people who were 15 years old. They thought I was fucking from another planet. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, you know, I remember having dinner with David and, you know, when he told me and he, he said that no one knew at the time, but he was he was telling me that he was going to go out on tour with Nine Inch Nails. And he was and he said to me, he goes, um, love to know your suggestions for songs that aren't singles, because I'm not going to play any singles during this tour. And I remember, you know, just bringing up certain things with him just at this dinner, talking about, you know, how Pumpkins had done Moon Age Daydream, STP had done Andy Warhol, obviously Nirvana had done The Men Who Sold the World. Um, and then I went up to the, uh, in Connecticut to like rehearsals for, before the opening night. Uh, but uh, talk to me about that touring with, you know, with Bowie and Trent, and then you're working with Trent Reznor, because of course you were, you had done, Soundtrack work with Trent. Tell me about how that relationship uh, transpired with you and Trent. Um, we didn't know each other. Another friend of mine who was 13 or 14 told me about Nine Inch Nails, an opera singer named Jessica Tibbins, and she was a big fan of them, and I had never heard of them either, and this is in the 90s. And all of a sudden, they're, we're sharing the stage with them, and David singing Hurt and uh, and and Trent is doing, you know, a song from Low on saxophone. <laughs> just, it was just unbelievable. And I didn't know him. And I was watching this band play from the side of the stage when I would have to duck when uh, guitars were flying in the air and water bottles and I had to get out of the way. But I just knew they they were great. And then in all these sound checks, Trent would always be like listening to me play. I could feel him listening, but in a very deep way. But we had never even been introduced, and we'd be walking through the dressing rooms, 
And we just nodded each other. And it was this like musical camaraderie, but I didn't know the guy. And uh, after the tour, there was uh, a keyboard magazine article, a downbeat, and they said, who would you most likely want to collaborate with? And he said, Mike Garson. And I thought, that's great, but nothing happened. And about two, three years later, he did the album called Fragile, and it was a double album. And I played on many, many tracks, but three landed on the album. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. And through the last 15, 20 years, he's called me to play piano on Gone Girl, the movie he scored. And recently, the movie Watchmen, that's a eight-part series, a nine-part series on... Uh, I guess it's HBO. Uh, he did the music for Watchmen, but the first three minutes of series of number one of the series, it starts with me playing like piano from uh, nineteen twenty. He asked if I could play cowboy music from the nineteen twenties, and uh, but take it a little weird in some spots. And uh, it was a melody that my dad had taught me on the piano that he picked up by ear from the, the movies, the silent movies of went. It was all this crazy stuff and then it went fast. And, and this lady is playing, <laughs> she, she's playing the piano, uh, looking at a movie in 1920, a black lady. And it, and it turns into a disaster and everyone gets shot and all this stuff. <laughs> and the piano starts getting like, like the very end, this kind of a thing. And uh, he, he called me, he said, I can't play this piano part. Can you write something and play the piano on that? So he calls me from time to time for different projects. And I, I love the guy. He's so, so talented, so sweet. And uh, he... David Bowie told me in 1995, watch out for this guy. This is the guy. Yeah. So when I, you know, went off to do some recording with him, I asked David's permission. I said, you okay? Because he, David liked when I did jazz albums, but only wanted me playing rock for him on his albums. So when I did some stuff with Billy Corgan and Pumpkins and, and, and with Trent, I asked David, he kind of said, you got to do what you got to do, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he gave me his blessing. And in fact, he respected Trent so much that he actually asked me to call him after some of the sessions and sort of fill him in. It was like uh, espionage or something because he was so in tune with what was going on on the music scene, as you know. And he would uh, survey people. He wanted to know David would be with his limo drivers and taxi drivers and asking questions. And you could feel all that in his, in his music. He, he, he was bigger than life and bigger than rock and roll and bigger than acting and bigger than fashion. He, he was our, I guess, Michelangelo or Da Vinci, right? Yeah, he was unbelievable. I mean, it was, and you know, I remember hearing him when he would guest DJ on radio stations when I was, you know, a young teen, I remember him turning me on to craft work. And then even like one time the Mekons, like his song called Where Were You? He was playing things. He was always so inquisitive and wanted to find things that were new, right? He was always searching and looking for new things and new inspirations, which is so genius. Genius. Well, I showed up on, I don't know if it was the outside sessions in Switzerland. He said, what albums have you been recording? And, and who are you playing with? And I had just done a Gershwin album and jazz album. He said, can you give it to me, a copy, you know? And, and then when I was writing classical music, he used to sit in his house in New York and listen to it. It's the most, like, complicated, avant-garde classical music. And I sent him the CD, and he was taking it all in, you know what I mean? And the fact that he was asking me to bring a jazz element with an avant-garde twist as early as 1972. And then Donnie McClasson with his band is playing those pieces on Black Star um, with a jazz band with another angle because it's 40 years later. You gotta give the guy credit for being ahead of his time. He called me in the mid nineties 
beyond enthusiasm, telling me about the internet. I'm just, what the fuck are you talking about? And I said, David, I'm working on some music. What are you blabbing to me about this internet? What is that? And he just said, I'm setting up this whole thing, and I'm going to have this site and this David Bo. I didn't know what he was talking about. Well, we know now what he's talking about. We wouldn't be talking now if there was no internet. So, I mean, he, he just got it. He just got it. I'm very, very fortunate to have been his friend and, and a collaborator for so many uh, pieces that I played with him. And, I mean, think of Life on Mars, for example. This one... Think of those beautiful melodies. I played that song with them 200 times. Yeah, and I'm sure it changes as well, which was... Uh... way you did that was so great i always love that and that's reminds me of david live you know the, the live album you know for the uh i mean that, you know i gotta give a lot of credit because he did that song on hunky dory which is one of my favorite albums and i'm not on that and the master uh, rick waiting played on original life on mars and on changes and just did a wonderful yeah. job and Bowie wanted him to join the live band at that time and of course he, he then he went jumped into yes but um I'm very happy he did that. I'm glad, <laughs> it's, I'm glad it for you, Mike. That's and it's really, it wouldn't have been the same. There's no question about that, you know. But you played on all those songs from that. I'm like, you've done all you pretty things over the years, and you know. That's right. But, That's right. So I, I need to also. So yeah, you know, Trent and I have known each other for a long time too, and I'm a huge fan of Trent and we've been friends since the pretty hate machine days. Oh, really, I love. Yeah, absolutely, known forever. Um, and I just thought it was so great when he and he and David, you know, put their minds together and did I'm Afraid of Americans. Uh, Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, it was incredible. Uh, you know, I want to talk to you, too, about a couple other things, like some of these legendary moments, like when you guys were on Dick Cavett during Young Americans. And David was, David was pretty wired that night. But you guys, that performance was incredible, no matter what. You know what I mean? Uh, doing 1984 and Young Americans. How much did you rehearse for that? Because you're sitting there with, you know, I mean, it, it sounded so good. Did you get much time to rehearse? It, it was part of that whole period of time when we were out and touring so and recording. So there wasn't extra time rehearsed for that. We just did a sound check. But we had known the music, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and you get there a few hours earlier. The thing about uh, the musicians that I had in that band, we all would do our homework at home people will say to me how can you play with this sax player or play with this trumpet player and you never met each other you've done enough work at home that when you pick a, a song that you're playing everybody knows kind of the rules so if somebody wants all blues <laughs> So we knew Young Americans, we knew uh, 1984, and it was just another time to get the opportunity. That would have been, when I ask uh, Cliff Slapper, who's the gentleman who wrote the biography on, on my life called Bowie's Piano Man, I, I asked him to see if he could count up how many shows I had done with David, because I had no idea. And it, it was over a thousand with the television and radio. And, and the next closest guy was like Carlos or else look at six or 700. And I was in shock because I kept thinking I was only hired for eight weeks. Yeah, it's amazing. You've done close to a thousand shows. Mike, what was, can you tell me about the last time that you saw David and the last time that you actually spoke to him? The last time physically I saw him, uh, we played an AIDS benefit with Alicia Keys and we did changes. And that's the last thing I did with him 
And that was my audition song with him in 1972. So it was bookends. But then a few months before he passed, uh, Cliff Slapper was working on the biography on my life, and he was interviewing a lot of people, and he gave me an assignment. He said, can you say something and listen to it? He, he chose about 50 songs that I played on David's albums. And would I listen to them all and write a paragraph about each one, which I did. That's in the book. But it was very overwhelming because uh, to listen to that much piano playing in a two or three hour period was not how I listened to music because I'm always at the piano making music here. I'm listening. So I was impressed, to be honest with you, and thinking, what a body of work I did with this guy. And I wrote David. I wrote him. And within three minutes, he answered me. And, and he said, Mike, uh, we did an absolute amazing body of work together. And I got off the phone and I was crying. And I said to my wife, I think... It's the last time I'm going to speak to him. He died a few months later. Wow, that's amazing. I'm glad you guys got to have that closure and he got to tell you how he felt about you. And Yeah, because I didn't know he was sick because being a close friend, sometimes with your closest friends, you don't want to tell them you're sick. Yeah, I know. And uh, it was just horrible, you know, uh, a big, big loss, but he... he he kept it from me, but I could feel something. I could feel something, uh, but I didn't have a clue that he was he was dying. Yeah, it was it was just one of the most amazing losses ever. That was a that was a, little, a little too soon, a little too soon. Yeah, but he sure left us a lot of music. Didn't he you? left us amazing stuff. He was just one of a kind. There's no question. How about how about his acting? Oh yeah, I mean I used to, I I saw him in Elephant Man on Broadway. With my high school girlfriend Marie, her and I went and we saw him do Elephant Man. You know, I was there '76 Nassau, uh, Nassau Coliseum Station to Station tour, and I remember him saying to me, "I go, you know, I, I was talking about the Salvador Dali film and the slash in the eyeballs," and I said, "You know, I, I know how the audience screamed," and he said to me, "David, he goes, I always knew I had ten minutes to get on the stage the minute I heard the audience scream because of the long Station to Station intro." So it was like pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah, man, I just, uh, yeah. I, I, I can't believe you would have seen that show. You would have been, I didn't think you were born. I was a then. young, I was a young guy. I was very young. I went with my, uh, I was, you know, like a, I was in my early, early teens and I went with, uh, I went with my girlfriend, you know, as much of a girlfriend as you can have when you're like, you know, 11 or 12. Uh, and her sister who was dating Johnny Thunders from the Dolls and the Heartbreakers. Um, and she took us all the way to see Bowie there. And it was a big deal for me because I loved him, you know, uh, and, uh, and always have so, but yeah, man, who so, you know, man who fell to earth, uh, all those movies, you know what I mean? That he did Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence labyrinth, right? Even this little bit, in, even in the hunger where Bauhaus, of course, did Bella Lugosi's dead, which I'm wearing that shirt today, but I gotta just say, Mike, I mean, it's amazing. I, you've been carrying on the tradition by doing that the Bowie initiative and collective. Tell me about how you put that together when you're going out and you're doing full albums like diamond dogs. Um, who's involved with that? Who ended up going out and playing with you on these? So after he passed um, over the last four years, I did about 120 shows, maybe more. And at least a hundred singers joined us at different times. Uh, we had from Living Color, Corey, you know, Corey. Rick Taylor, great guy. Great guy, right? Rick Taylor. Uh, Steam, Steam came on stage. He did yeah. uh, Lazarus and Black Star. Ian Astbury joined us. Perry Farrell. Uh, Lord sang Life on Mars with me and David at the Brits Awards with Jerry Leonard and uh, Sterling Campbell and Gail and Dorsey and Earl Slick. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, I had... So many great singers. Bernard Fowler, who's been with the Rolling Stones forever. He was a great front man. Uh, we had Joe Sumner, which is Sting's, uh, Sting's son. Um, it just went on and on. Sash Jordan, 
from Canada, who's an amazing blues singer. She joined us on the last tour. And I just, I didn't expect to be doing this, but I sort of act as the uh, MC and uh, pianist and, and musical director and put the music together. I, I think I have a great respect for his songs. So just like when I grew up, I listened to Cole Porter and Richard Rogers and George Gershwin, Burt Bacharach, Marvin Hamlish. I used to play their songs, Michelle Legrand, uh, and great singers, Tony Bennett, Sinatra, whatever, would sing these great standards. Well, David wrote great standards, Life on Mars, Changes, Strangers When We Meet. These are amazing songs, Man Who Sold the World, right? So to carry on those songs is a great feeling and to have other singers make it their own and sing it. You know, I, I mean, it was a shame, but I'm no different than any other musician. Our tour was cut short in the pandemic. I had done four shows in America. We had done many in Europe and Israel. That was before. There probably was a pandemic, but nobody knew about it. We were in Europe in January. And then I did four shows and 24 got canceled. So I will tour it again. Uh, in 2022, David will have would have been 75 years old. So I, I would like to do a big world tour then. Um, I'd like to see 70% of the world vaccinated so people would feel safe coming out. Uh, I don't want people to be nervous. Uh, I am booked for a year from September for a tour, but it, it might just not happen. I, I want to make sure people are safe and they feel good about it. So, but there's a renaissance occurring. I see it happening on the other side of this. There's so many great artists doing so many great things as we speak. And, and this is going to be, people are going to really appreciate a live show after all this and really appreciate it. I mean, we're doing the best we can with Zoom and I love performing. I mean, I'm an introverted kind of person that's always in the studio creating by myself all day long, 10, 15 hours a day. And I don't need anyone around me when I'm doing that, but I am a performer and I love being around people and, and sharing the magic. And no matter how many records I've done, there's nothing that feels better than an audience that's appreciating what you're doing, whether in actual fact it's five people or the biggest audience I've ever played for, I think was a half a million people with the pumpkins in, in, in Minneapolis. But we did Glastonbury with David Bowie in 2000, was a quarter of a million there. So they're all the same to me. If I have one person, if I'm playing for you, I'm going to play the best I could possibly play. And I haven't forgot to play the Aladdin saying, I'm just crossing off my list to see if I've gotten to six licks that you've asked for. Oh, yeah. And that'll be the seventh. I didn't play this one for you, which... Uh <laughs> God, I love that so much, Lady Grinning Soul. What a, Is that a, great what a beautiful song. song and a way to end that album, man. Aladdin Sane. What a, you know, and it's and when you're a kid, you know, and you're listening to rock and roll, that was so different to hear that intro that you created for that song. It's just a beautiful, beautiful song. I love that track so much. It's so good. Um, never, David never sang it live. Would you believe that? I know it's it's amazing that he never did. It's uh, it's very high, you know. Yeah. It, it's a very high song because when he when he starts with she comes she goes like that whole he would have to nail that note you know it should, <laughs> <laughs> it should have been incredible. didn't you sing it for me a few weeks ago you went up there for me you sang it for me yeah I did I did sing it for you in the, yeah I did right well when we're online you you, you we, we were, oh yeah I did it for you before we went live right so I I actually sang I busted into <laughs> out, out of natural I sang you did a good job that's all I know I know it was pretty amazing that I actually sang that but I. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was great because I love I love those tracks. It was uh, I'm glad you reminded me of that because that was funny. But it was so natural, I could not do it when you played that part of the song. Because like those records are just such a big, such a part of my life. And, and you know, I think to myself, you know, 
um, your knowledge of, of this whole genre of music, which I, I'm a novice, I'm a performer in it, and I, I always contribute my best. I love playing for singers I'm hoping to play with. I like those three girls from Mexico. I would oh, you're the warning. I love to play on a track with them. I, I love Lizzie. I'd like to do a track with her. So many people that I'm learning about it, because I've always enjoyed co-creating with uh, singers, you know, and it's, it's one of my biggest joys. But I was thinking that, you know, you could do this interview and know so much about David, but you could do the same thing and know the same about, about Lou Reed or about Mick or who, who, whoever you were doing. I could do what you're doing about jazz from, say, 1940 to, say, 19. 80, for example, and I, I would be that kind of encyclopedia talking about Bill Evans and McCoy Tyner and Keith Jarrett and Bud Powell and Wynton Kelly, and that's the only way I'm able to relate to people who love David and come to me and talk to me about he changed their life. I, I was talking to one girl when I was playing in London, some solo concerts uh, last year, and she said that she was just about to commit suicide, and she heard Aladdin saying piano playing my piano playing, she said she decided to live. Now, how, how would I know that I was having that effect on a person? It's very scary, but thank God, you know. I say thank God it's true. Music has saved so many lives and still continues to do so. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing. And uh, I love that stuff, Mike. And, you know, think about all the other people you play with, too, like St. Vincent and what you just did uh, with Morrison Hotel Gallery, Neva, and Music Cares, the Detour. Uh, you know, all day marathon festival that we did. And you, you know, you played a great version of heroes with Gavin Rossdale and, you know, you performed with Linda Perry and, and Charlie Sexton and, you know, St. Vincent, you've done stuff with, and she's fantastic. I played with her on a record, uh, believe it or not, with the polyphonic sprees. That's when we met. Oh yeah. I know. I know. I know, <laughs> I know, Tim, I know Tim Rowell very well for the pop. <laughs> I sat with them and I played on one of their albums, Fragile Army. The piano yeah. all over the place, and, and and I met Annie Clark, you know, and and she said, "Would I play on her first album?" And the rest is history. I I love contributing to great artists, and I'm looking for that next great one that I could make some magic with, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you will. I mean, and you, I want to. You'll find me that person. I know it. I am going to find you that person, Mike, because you're so great. And that's you're because we belong to a certain club. We do. It's the special, special, it's a very special club. Yeah. It's very elite. It's almost a cult. We put our heads together. How do we? We, do we look like cult guys, but it's really funny because you think about it. <laughs> the best thing is, in you know, you're you're at, it, it takes less time to shower. That's for sure, right? Although you got to really cover it when, when it's too sunny out, or at least use sunblock just to make sure you're okay. But uh, it's cool. I mean, it's great being both. Gail and Dorsey, who's a close friend of mine, great bass player and singer, and who was with me with David 10, 15 years, she had shaved her head before me, and I was scared. And she literally gave me the handbook, what I do. You go in the shower, and you put the soap there, and you do this. I, w I was nervous, and she, she gave me the whole uh, manual on how to do it, and I never looked back, you know? Yeah, it's you know, I, I played with Billy Corgan. He used to like to put me in wigs. Yeah, because he wanted to be the only bald guy on stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's amazing. So, um, you know, I just want to, Mike, I want to thank you. Is there anything else you'd like? I want to mention to everybody, they should pick up the book, Bowie's Piano Man, which is great. There's a book on your life, which I'm very, very, I, I, I'm just, I'm very excited about. Is there anything else you'd like to play? I think I have to, um, like I said, I've played Aladdin saying many times with David. Then there were many years we didn't play it. We hadn't played it for over 20 years. And then I played it on my tours with various singers, Corey Glover sang it, Gail and Dorsey sang it. But in actual fact, I never played the melody of the song because I'm just known for the solo. You know, where I'm doing all that stuff, all that kind of stuff. But I never played the melody because David would sing it. So I'd like to see if I could, for the first time, because you're here and play it for you, the song uh, where you'll hear the melody and you'll hear a piano solo. Of course, I have no bass or drums, but I'll sort of 
try to make it one cohesive piece. Would you like that before we close? Oh, I would love that. That'd be amazing, Mike. This would be great. Okay. I'm going to do my best. Mike, that was so great. Thank you so much for doing that. Ah, thank you for all the beautiful, beautiful contributions that you made to all of David's music, you know, and um, just so grateful that we have that music and it's been a big, big part of my life and I know so many other people's lives. So we all thank you and for all the other great collaborations you've done. It was really exciting. It was great to finally get to sit down and talk to you about all these recordings in your life. So I, thanks for taking the time and doing this today. It was magical. And, and thank you for your comparable contribution because the music needs to continue to grow, expand, and have new generations hearing this great artist. And I'm glad that I would be an unknown musician more than likely if it wasn't for David. I'd still be playing, and I'd probably have a, a good career. But something about the fact that we were put together – there's some reason that I don't fully know yet, and I'm happy I don't know it, but it, it's magical. And so, but thank you for being you. Yeah, I appreciate it, Mike. That was great. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. It was amazing. So great to hear all those songs. Mike, take good care, man. It was, it was awesome. Did I get all seven of them? 
<laughs> did I get all seven of the licks? That you did, you got a lot of great ones there. <laughs> I was so happy you did We Are the Dead too, because I, you know what I mean. And, <laughs> and the intro, <laughs> so amazing. I, that, right? I just. Yeah, because Diamond Dog is one of my favorite albums. I think it's an underrated record. I mean, it, it's loved. There's no question about it. But that record is so special. So you know? special. Well, you know, David was finding his own wings, and he was out of the spider world, and he was he was in. He had to prove that he could do it. I mean, that playing on the rhythm part on uh, Rebel Rebel is him on guitar, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's I, what a feel. Yeah, when he'd, when he'd sit on the piano and and show me some songs, pretty things and what have you, uh, just great piano playing. Uh, very simple, but very to the point and perfect. You know. Yeah, I mean, he was had that knack for just being able to do that and write so many great songs, and uh, I love that stuff. So, Mike, listen, take care, man. Thanks for joining us. It was awesome to have you. I really want to tell you that. My pleasure. Have a great night. Mike Garson, everybody. It was so great to have Mike here. And uh, I, I so enjoyed that, you know, because I'm such a Bowie fan. And it was just an incredible, incredible show. And if you missed any part of it, uh, it's going to be available and up on uh, demand. You can actually watch it uh, online here uh, through YouTube and Rolling Live Studios, the entire show. It's called In a Lonely Place. My name is Matt Pinfield. And, of course, we named the show after uh, the Humphrey Bogart movie from 1950, the New Order and the Smithereen songs. We just thought it was perfect for the pandemic, and we hope you've enjoyed the show tonight. Thanks so much for watching. Keep music first in your heart, and I will be back with you soon. Take care. <laughs>